to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. We're coming to you with another Manifest program from the Nation of Israel, a very special prophetic teaching, and we have a pre-partners tour. Hello. <laughs> that was their signal to do something. <laughs> now, this is their first day of taping, so they're all fresh. It's all new to them, so we'll just have to get them broke in. By the end of the trip, they'll be pros at all this, you know. Uh, it's raining today, which... Uh, you can still have a great tour in the rain, but Israel's been needing the rain, so we're thankful it's been raining for them. They've been in a bad drought, and of course, they always said when, the, when God's men come to a nation, it's supposed to rain. That's what they say in Africa, so we're just going to accept that, that that's the favor of the Lord. We want to teach you today, but some of you have been aware of the fact, because we made you aware of this just recently, that we completed a teaching on the book of Revelation, which is seven DVDs or 14 hours worth of teaching on the book of Revelation. I've been working on this project for about four years. And what I want to do today is to begin to share with you something, a particular message that, I want to, that I've simply titled The Seven Laws of Prophecy or The Laws of Interpreting Biblical Prophecy. Now, it's not the Bible where we have complications, but it's how people interpret the Bible where the complications come in. For an example, let me say this to you. If you talk about the Holy Spirit, do you receive the Holy Spirit the moment you're converted? Do you receive the Holy Spirit at a time you're baptized in water? Do you receive the Holy Spirit uh, uh, with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Differences of opinions. You have teachings uh, such as, and I wrote a list down here, baptism. Do you sprinkle? Do you go at baptism? Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, baptism in the name of Jesus only. I mean, you can keep going on with the different uh, ideas, predestinations. Are you born to be saved or to be lost? Do you have a choice in the matter? Unconditional eternal security or eternal uh, 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 it's security based on no conditions whatsoever. The gifts of the Spirit, did they cease? Do they continue in our day and time? And I think you can see by going on and on that there are just differences of opinion. The same is true when it comes to how do you interpret biblical prophecy. When it comes to the return of Christ, you've got the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, no-trib. When it comes to the return of Christ, you have individuals that's trying to figure out is there only one coming or is there two comings. And so there seems to be a lot of complications when it comes to interpreting biblical prophecy, to know how to interpret it. What are the laws of biblical interpretation? Having said that, there's two different, there's two different uh, types of laws. There is the... Um, the laws of what we call Judaism, which are the laws of the Jewish rabbis that they have interpreting prophecy. And then we have what's called the laws of Christian interpretation. Now, very quickly, let me just run by uh, to you, if you're not familiar with this, some of the what we call rabbinical laws of interpreting the Bible. First is examining the words, because in the original Hebrew text, there are letters that are missing where the word appears to be misspelled. But sometimes that word has a certain number value, and they go to the missing letter, and they find out that it has a meaning. In other words, it was there for a purpose. For example, the word generations is spelt a certain way in the book of Genesis, where it talks about before the fall of Adam and right after the fall of Adam. And then all of a sudden, a vav is missing all the way to the book of Ruth. And then it talks about the generations after Ruth, and the vav is reinserted back in. So what rabbis do is they say, why is there a missing vav? And they have a whole theory on that. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's interesting. They have a system called gematria in Judaism where the Hebrew alphabet, every letter of the alphabet has a numerical value, and they add up those values to see if it matches the value of another word. And then they begin to put those words together. In Christian theology, however, they have what's called uh, schools of interpretation or scholarly interpretations called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is just, is just one of those fancy words meaning principles for interpreting, principles for interpreting the Bible. So, when we look at the Christian setting, we have the historical setting, which is the grammar, the geography, the culture of the day. The covenant setting, is it from the old covenant, is it from the new covenant? We have the divisional setting, is it to the Jews, is it to, is it to the Gentiles? Or is it addressed to Christians? Then you also have what's called the promise setting. Are the promises past? Have they already been fulfilled? Are they uh, present? Can we, can we claim a promise right now? Or are they promises of the future, meaning it's more of, of a prophetic realm? So without me going into more detail, because I could spend a lot of time on that, let's go into what I call the seven laws of interpreting Bible prophecy. And I think our partners here that have never heard this taught, and those of you watching the program today, are going to find this interesting. Now, uh, prophetic interpretation number one, here's what you have to examine when looking at prophecy. 
Was the Old Testament prophecy fulfilled in the New Testament? And here's some examples. Isaiah 7, 14, the Messiah would be born of, a, born of a virgin. That was fulfilled in Matthew 1, 23. Out of Egypt calling my son, Hosea 11, verse 1, fulfilled in Matthew 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, there would be a light in Zebulun coming out of Galilee, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. Isaiah 53, verse 5, the Messiah taking our infirmities was fulfilled in Matthew 8, 17. Ministering to the Gentiles, Isaiah chapter 49 was fulfilled in Matthew 12, 18. Casting lots for the, for the garment of Christ, which happened on the cross, of course, is mentioned in Psalms 22, but it's fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 35. Now, what that means is this, that if you're looking at prophecies, were they fulfilled in the New Testament? If they were specifically fulfilled, fulfilled with the first coming of Christ, then we can't lay hold of those for the second coming of Christ if they are strictly first coming prophecies. The second way to interpret biblical prophecy is this. Was the Old Testament prophecy fulfilled somewhere in history? When you go to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, when you see that metallic image of King, King Nebuchadnezzar, gold, silver, brass, and iron, you go to the history and you'll discover that that's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. You go to the Daniel chapter 7, for example, which is the um, revelation Daniel had of those particular beasts. Those empires, many of them have already been fulfilled through history. So sometimes you've got to take prophetic scriptures and you've got to ask yourself, was that scripture fulfilled? That scripture fulfilled at some point in history. And so you can do that by, by actually researching history. For example, um, Isaiah 66 and verse 8 says that shall a nation be born in a day as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. That's very clear, a prophecy concerning the restoration of the nation of Israel in a day. That happened in May of 1948. You can go to other scriptures and you discover Ezekiel, which is the prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones. And in the Valley of Dry Bones, it says that they are no longer two nations, but will become one nation. God says they will become a great army, Ezekiel 37, verse 10. God says in Ezekiel 37, 21, he'll bring out Israel out of the nations into their own land. Now, I met some Holocaust survivors in Israel many years ago, and they all said to me that Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, was a fulfillment of the Holocaust, that after the Holocaust, God brought them out of their graves. They looked like skeletons, many of the people did, and brought them back to the land. So to interpret prophecy, you have to look at the verse and chapter and say, has this been fulfilled sometime in history? The third law of interpreting biblical prophecy is this. Was the prophecy addressed in the New Testament to Israel, to the church, or to the Gentiles? To Israel, the church, or the Gentiles? For example, in Romans chapter 11, when it says, All Israel shall be saved, blindness in part has happened to Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That has nothing to do with the church, to do with national Israel. Israel, this nation that we're standing in right here as we're doing this taping. When you read, for example, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, it's addressed to the seven churches of Asia. Now, that has nothing to do with Israel. That has to do with the church. That has to do with the called out ones, the men and women who had a covenant with God back in John's day. When you look, for example, at the book of Galatians, Paul talks about the Gentiles and reaching the Gentiles and the ministry to the Gentiles. Testament, prophetic scriptures are either addressed to Israel, national Israel, the nation that we're standing in here right now while we're taping, or it can be addressed not only to Israel, it may be addressed specifically to the church, to the church at Philippi, to the church at Corinth, or it may be addressed to the Gentile nations. For example, in the book of Revelation, there's a lot of scriptures that deal with judgment that's going to be coming on the Gentile nations during the time of the tribulation. So the third law of interpreting prophecy is, in the context of the verse that you're reading, is it talking about Israel? Is it talking about the church? Or is it talking about the Gentile nations? The fourth law of interpreting biblical prophecy is this. Take the literal sense of the prophecy first, unless symbolism is used. Now, I want to say something that's very important. Uh, especially in the United States, there's a revival of preaching in which a lot of scriptures are being considered allegories or they're considered metaphors, and they're no longer taken literal. There's one man who's written a very popular book, and no hell. He says that, you know, basically, and I'm not just saying him, but there's others that believe the same way who say, that hell is simply the trouble that you're having on earth. Hell is the fiery trials that you go through on earth. 
And so what happens is this, instead of taking hell as a literal place, which every verse that Jesus gave us in the New Testament, it was literal. And in the book of Revelation, it's literal. They make it a metaphor or an allegory. The first thing you've got to do is realize that prophecy can be taken literal, can be taken literal, unless there is symbolism used, it has to be interpreted. So if the Bible says there's fire in hell, there's fire in hell. Another thing is he heaven. It's real funny, the people who don't believe in hell being literal, believe heaven is literal. I mean, how do you explain that? He heaven's literal, but hell's not. And heaven, uh, and to some people who may not believe in it, believe heaven is your positive thoughts. Heaven is the energy that gives you life. No, heaven is a place with streets of gold, gates of pearl, angels, and Jesus. All right, just so you'll know, in case you didn't know that. So you've got to, you've got to understand New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation chapter 21, that city coming down from God out of heaven that has 12 precious stones as its foundation, that's not an allegory. That's not some kind of a metaphor that represents the 12 foundations of a positive spiritual life. How in the world can you get that out of that chapter in the book of Revelation is what I want to know. So in other words, there is a literal city. How do I know? Because the Bible says Abraham looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and whose maker was God. So it's a literal place. And then another example is angels and demons. There are some people out there now writing books and, you know, making movies that, you know, angels and demons are just the negatives and the positives of a person's, person's mind. You're thinking good thoughts are angelic thoughts. You're thinking evil thoughts are demonic thoughts. Now, your evil thoughts can come from a demon. I can assure you of that. But angels exist and demonic powers exist. So my point is, and I want to go over this again, that when you're looking at prophecy and it says something is going to happen and it talks about maybe in the book of Revelation, all these cosmic judgments, don't turn it into an allegory and don't turn it into a metaphor. I've always liked this statement. When the plain sense of the scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. Oh, that, I heard somebody say that's right. Can we get an amen right there? That's pretty good. That's pretty good teaching. But it really is true. That's, that's something that you always need to remember when you're reading the Bible. When the plain sense of the scripture is making sense, seek no other sense. All right? I know that, can you see how they're all keeping notes here? No, really, really, I told them to pay attention, so they're not going to be writing much while we're, while we're teaching. All right, what number are we on? Are you keeping up with it? <laughs> One, two, three, four, we're on five. Who said five? You win a free car. No, I'm only kidding. No, no I'm kidding. This is a joke. Number five, and this is, this is a law of interpreting biblical prophecy. Ready? Here's the law of interpreting biblical prophecy. Let the symbols of the apocalyptic scriptures, which is, for example, Daniel, the book of Revelation, let them interpret themselves. In other words, you don't want to just read something in the Bible and make out of it what you want it to be, again, using an allegorical method or a metaphor. Uh, because what will happen is the Bible will always interpret itself. And I'm going to prove this to you. This has not been rehearsed. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you some symbols in the Bible. Tell me who you think they represent. Ready? A snake. Satan or the devil. Satan or the devil. Everybody said that, okay? Exactly, that's exactly, exactly right. Because in the book of Genesis, Satan came as a serpent, right? In the book of Revelation, he's called the great serpent, the dracon or the dragon. A dove. The Holy Spirit. Everybody said the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he came in the form of a dove at the baptism of Jesus. Now, here's a good one. Everybody ready? A lamb. Was this rehearsed? No. <laughs> see, see what I'm saying? They know properly by, that the Bible interprets itself. How do we know Jesus is the Lamb? Because John said in John chapter 1, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Book of Revelation, he's the Lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. We know it because the Bible says it that way. Why do we know Satan is a serpent? Genesis 3, he came in the serpent. He beguiled Eve according to the New Testament. Chapter 12, Revelation, that serpent, that dragon, that devil. So it tells you who he is. Holy Spirit being a dove. So in other words, if you go into the scriptures, remember, let the prophetic scriptures and the symbolism interpret themselves. It always will. It's just like biblical numbers. Six is always man. Seven is always completion or perfection. Okay, here is the next law of interpreting the scripture. Take the days and the years literal unless indicated. Now, over the years, a lot of people have gotten in trouble doing this. What they do is... In the book of Revelation, it mentions 1,260 days. In the book of Daniel, 1,290 days. And in chapter 12, 1,335 days. Now, based on two scriptures, one is where Ezekiel is told to lie on his left side and his right side, 
one day representing each year of, Israel, of Judah's disobedience and then Israel's disobedience. And then where the children of Israel wandered for 40 years based on the, the spies going in for 40 days. It, they, for every day that they didn't believe, they got a year in the wilderness. That's an exchange called the year for the day exchange. And it's found two places in the Bible. Now, years ago, it, this happened especially in the 1800s because I have a lot of their books. A lot of biblical uh, scholars, men that preached prophecy, would take these numbers and turn them into days. And then what they would do is they would go back to the Babylonian captivity, which is the, Israel's first captivity, or they would go to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and they would start adding 1,335 years 1,260 years. And so they start coming up with dates depending on how they did it of like 1844, 1896. And they would begin to make projections that a lot of things would happen on those years. Now, every now and then somebody would hit it. But what happened is some people start predicting that the Lord was going to return on those years. And when he didn't return, it kind of messed up everything. And you know what happens, and this is really sad, that type of thing where major predictions are made and the date doesn't happen it causes some people who are already skeptical just to become more skeptical. And you tell them how much you love Bible prophecy. It's like, oh, yeah, you're a real nut like that guy that missed it. No, we're not nuts like the guy that missed it because I can save you a whole lot of money telling you never buy a book, video, or DVD that says they know when Jesus is coming because the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. Even the angels don't know yet, and that's what Jesus said. So I would, I would, believe, I would believe Jesus over Dr. Hickamosi. You know what I mean? <laughs> Because Dr. Hickamosi has missed the dates before, whoever, whoever that might be, by the way. So the point is, in the prophecies, be sure that if it mentions days, keep them as days. If it mentions years, keep them as years, because the Bible is very specific about that. Okay, here's another thing you need to know. The next law of interpreting biblical prophecy is identify the terms used in the prophecy. Let me give you some terms used in biblical prophecy. In the last days, now in the English Bible, that phrase is found eight times. In the latter days, is found 11 times in the Bible. The time of the end is used five times in the book of Daniel. Sometimes it will be used twice in one verse. So when, when, you do, when you do your count, you have to go to a computer software program to get the exact count. It doesn't mean verses necessarily in some of these. It could be used once or twice in some instances. And in that day is used 114 times in the Bible. Now, the reason I'm giving you these terms, last days, latter days, time of the end, and in that day, most scholars who have studied this issue say that these are terms used about the time of the end prior to the Messiah coming to rule and reign on the church, uh, uh, rule and reign on the earth. So uh, Acts chapter 2.17 says, In the last days God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Now, I'm going to add another one in here. I'm going to add another one that... Uh, that I want to go ahead and just throw out there and mention to you. Always compare the Old Testament and New, verse, New Testament verses together when comparing the future. Now, when we did just recently our Revelation series, we taught, except for, I think, the sixth DVD, which was, is called the Millennial Code, which we've offered before, but we went ahead and put it in the package. All the other teaching was done from the studio. One of the things that fascinated me when I started studying the book of Revelation and doing this series was the number of times that the book of Revelation either quotes or uses the Old Testament scripture. Are you ready for this? The Apocalypse, which is the book of Revelation, quotes from the Old Testament references 249 times. And, and so when I, when I found this out, I started realizing that when they talk about cosmic activity here, Isaiah had already predicted that, but Isaiah gives you more detail than John did. Or they're talking about the battle of, uh, uh, of Armageddon. You can go to the Old Testament in Zechariah chapters 12, 13, 14. He'll give you more detail than John just saying he gathered them together at a place called Armageddon or Armageddon. So one thing I found out in, in, in studying in detail, if you want to really be detailed about it, the book of Revelation is you've got to tie it in with other Old Testament scriptures because the book of Revelation, this is the way I look at it. The, the vision that John saw is the combination of what all the Old Testament prophets saw. In other words, when this one would see this and that one would see that and this one would see that, everybody had their word, but John comes along and takes it all and puts it all together and shows you how it all fits. Uh, one of the reasons I said this on an earlier program that people don't study the book of Revelation, for example, is because of the symbolism or because they say it's just too complicated to interpret. But when you understand, here's the point. 
when John wrote that book, he wrote it in a, a Jewish culture where there was a lot of Jewish people who already knew the law and the prophets. So when he wrote certain things, they were already familiar with some of the things he was writing because the prophets had already talked about those things. And this is what a lot of people miss because they think the book of Revelation is a vision that came out of nowhere and nobody knew anything about it. No, no, no. It's a lot of the Old Testament. In fact, one of the things that I, uh, uh, that I like is those seven angels, remember, that's, that's bringing the last judgments onto the earth. They go into the temple of heaven and bring out the last judgments. Do you realize when you go to the end of the book of Revelation and you read what it says, it's one of the seven angels that's in that group that is showing John the vision. Do you realize that when it says, and then John goes to worship the angel. What does that angel say? Don't worship me. I am of your fellow servants and of the prophets and them that keep the saying, worship Jesus. You know what I believe? I'm going to throw a nugget out there. I'm going to throw it out there and leave it alone. Ready? It is very possible the seven angels, because the Greek word angels can be a human messenger or heavenly, depending on the setting, the context. I believe those seven angels are seven prophets of the Old Testament that pour out the judgment they prophesied about. Oh, I'm going to leave it there. That's why you need to get this series I'm getting ready to do. Because the series we just did on the book of Revelation is full of stuff like this. So uh, our announcer is going to come. We're going to share with you how to get the brand new series of Breaking the Apocalypse Code that was recently done. And then if you'll stay with us, what we're doing, we're doing some major conferences this year. One of the things I'm doing, I'm doing the book of Daniel. A major teaching from the book. Man, look, the book of Daniel is starting to be fulfilled right now. There's enti entire passages all through the book, and most people don't even know about it. And so you need to get to some of the conferences this year, especially the larger ones where we do the bigger teaching, the longer teaching, because we're going to have a great time in the Lord. All right, we'll be right back. Come on, let me hear it. Have you enjoyed the Word today? Yeah. Do you have tough questions about end-time prophecy? If so, here are hundreds of answers to Perry Stone's new advanced study, Breaking the Apocalypse Code. Difficult and controversial questions are answered in an easy-to-understand format as you see and hear Perry Stone's teaching, Breaking the Apocalypse Code. In this new 7-DVD advanced study series, Perry gleans from thousands of hours of biblical research tapping into Hebraic rabbinical insight, special word studies, and ancient temple information to present this landmark prophetic series. The 22 chapters of the Apocalypse are clearly explained in seven two-hour DVDs totaling 14 hours of eye-opening, exciting prophetic insight. With colorful props, pictures, and video footage from Israel, maps, and special charts, you will see and hear the information that will carry you into the future, from the catching away of the church to the descent of the new Jerusalem from heaven to earth at the conclusion of Christ's millennial reign. These seven DVDs include the following subjects. DVD number one reveals the mystery of the Apocalypse Code and the Heavenly Temple. DVD number two examines the creatures and people in the throne room, the priesthood and the beginning of the tribulation. DVD number three explains the mysterious two witnesses, the Bema judgment, the great dragon and the kingdom of the beast. DVD number four gives amazing insight into the future Islamic Antichrist and false prophet and the empire of the beast. DVD number five explains with clarity the coming Mark of the Beast 666, the mysterious harlot and mystery Babylon. DVD number six, priests from Israel called the Millennial Code explains the 1,000 year reign of Christ in Jerusalem. DVD number seven gives prophetic insight into your eternal future when Satan is bound and heaven comes down. When you order, Perry will also include his personal outlines from these teachings, which have been compiled into this study syllabus with over 100 pages. This study syllabus is available only when you order the seven DVD series. To request the Breaking the Apocalypse Code DVD series and study syllabus, call 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 or go online to perrystone.org. You may also write to us at Perry Stone, Post Office Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and request gift offer AC95. Shipping and handling are included. 
Spend hours in study with Perry Stone, one of America's foremost recognized prophetic teachers, and hear the latest updates in this dynamic series. We look forward to hearing from you soon.